Today we're going to be looking at how I designed and built a CO2 laser cutter. I thought it'd be valuable to share my experience of the process and explain my reasoning and methodologies. So even if you're not specifically interested in building a complete laser cutter from scratch, you'll hopefully be able to take something away from this. So let's get into it. I started by modeling the assemblies in CAD. I used Rhino because that's what I was fastest with at the time, but if I was doing it again, I'd use Fusion 360 for its parametric features. The design considerations were mainly motivated by two factors, size and price. I wanted to make the cutting bed area as large as possible for the overall footprint of the machine, and that footprint could be no wider than a door frame, since a single door was the only way in and out of my shed. This should correspond with optimizing the size of components to a common metric. I'm using aluminium slotted profile for the build, which is typically sold in one meter lengths. So having components that were say 510 millimeters would be more wasteful than something like 490. So that was just something to be aware of. So after I'd gone through a few different iterations, I was comfortable with the design. So I pulled the trigger and started ordering parts. The first stage was creating the X and Y gantry from 420 aluminium V-slot rail. I'm using a regular wood blade to cut the aluminium but I have it clamped to the work surface and I'm feeding the blade through quite slowly. For getting accurate cuts across multiple parts, I tape them together and then make a single cut. With the aluminium cut, I can start to see my gantry cutting area IRL for the first time. Right now it's one meter by half a meter, but once all the hardware is on and assembled, I'd like it to still have a 800 by 400 millimeter effective cutting area. Because this is my first time using the V-slot rail system in a project, I spent a bit of time figuring out the best method of assembly. It's all quite intuitive, but I did find pressing the bearings in flush required a little bit of finessing. What's awesome about using the slotted aluminium profiles is how quickly the parts go together and being able to get a rolling gantry within an hour or so is really satisfying. With the gantry plates on, I started assembling the belt hardware. I actually ended up having to grind a small groove in all of the four corners of the V-slot so the belt could run smoothly through. I didn't notice that collision in the 3D model because I had the belt lying across the top of the aluminium, whereas in reality it likes to sit a little bit lower down into the slot. This is the X gantry plate which I made from two layers of cast acrylic. I had to custom make this because I designed the plate to span the 40mm long side of the rail rather than the standard 20mm short side. I did it like that to minimize racking forces but it's obviously a bit more of a hassle than just buying a standard component. For holding the laser mirrors to the gantries I used cast acrylic again. To make them double thickness I joined two layers with acrylic welding cement which chemically bonds the parts together. I'm using 3D printed parts for many of my components, and here I'm assembling the laser tube holder. I 3D printed initial prototypes in PLA before reprinting them later in ABS for better long term performance. With the X and Y axis locked in, I could assemble the Z axis. Determining the height of the Z axis was more of a best guess type thing. I didn't want to undersell myself by making it so shallow that I was restricted to only thin sheet goods, but then I didn't want to go too deep and be wasteful on construction and space so I opted for a safe middle ground of around 200mm. From here on in the build I'm using T-slot aluminium profile rather than the V-slot. The V-slot is specifically designed to have the moving gantry components attached to it and is a little bit more expensive and harder to get. So for just framing applications the T-slot is slightly more economical. If you're new to slotted aluminium profiles, generally the easiest way to assemble them is to preload brackets and your other hardware, slide it down into the slots, and then go through it and tighten it down once you've got everything aligned. I designed the Z-axis to raise and lower via 8mm threaded rods in each corner, with 8mm smooth rods and linear bearings to guide them. Movement is from a 10mm wide GT2 closed belt running around pulleys at the base of the threaded rods which will just be hand operated at this stage for simplicity. The cutting bed frame uses 40-20 T-slot for extra rigidity across its length and 20-20 bracing on the inside just because I'm trying to keep costs down.
With the Z-axis fitted and the bed moving, it's time to tackle the electronics. I had originally planned to install the electronics in a drawer in the back of the base, where they'd be hidden away and not take up space. I quickly realized when I mocked this up that accessibility was just going to be a nightmare, so I instead opted to make an external box where I could just easily get to the wiring. I'm using a AWC 608 commercial DSP controlling system, which comes with its own CAM software. It may be a bit more expensive than going down the open source route, but everything's basically plug and play and it comes with a really solid interface. With everything laid out, it's just a matter of going through and methodically wiring everything together. Once everything was kind of connected, I wanted to get the axes driving around, so I fitted the 6mm wide GT2 timing belts, um, which are a little narrow for this application, and I also had to go around and file off some of the corners of the aluminium profile as they were still snagging the belt slightly. Fitting the mechanical limit switches is a straightforward process of just finding a good solid contacting position and then drilling, tapping and bolting them into place. With that done and a bit of calibration to get the Axis stepper motors running correctly, I could finally test out the gantry CNC motion. Uh, excuse the phone, I was doing an Instagram story. <coughs> Link to my Instagram in the description below. With everything now moving, it was time to take the next major step, installing the actual laser. So I placed the tube into position and fixed the mirrors onto the axes. My laser uses a water cooling system, so I topped that up and began the slow process of aligning the laser beam. This process is to make the laser beam run perfectly in line across the length and width of the X and Y axis as the beams bounce through three mirrors. This is done by adjusting the height, position and angle of the tube, mirrors and nozzle sequentially until you get the laser beam landing consistently. Now that the motion was working and the laser was firing, I could start on enclosing it all up. The first thing I used the laser for was to cut a faceplate so that I could tidy up the electronics. For monitoring I'm using both digital and analog ammeters. Because the analog meter doesn't jump around as quickly, it can give clearer overall readings. For the outer enclosure I was originally just going to bang something out using wood I had lying around. However, after mocking it up I realized how bad that would look and how much extra time it would actually take. So I just stayed with the T-slot profiles. One of my larger design choices was to have an entirely separate outer enclosure over the XYZ gantry. In almost all of the designs I'd researched, the gantry axes were part of or connected to the outer frame of the machine itself. I wanted to have my gantry self-contained for the reason it would be easier to keep square and rigid, and if anything was to impact the laser machine, it would only hit the outer enclosure and not affect the inner gantry at all. It also meant that I didn't need to bog myself down on building the outer enclosure to a sub-millimeter tolerance, which saved on material cost and time. I wanted to make everything as accessible as possible, so for the front panel I went with a sliding door layout with a clear panel in the middle. This allowed me to easily get to the bottom of the machine and to be able to lift the panels completely out if I wanted to fit oversized materials in, and also gave me visibility so I could see the underside of materials being cut. I didn't go with a hinged door because space was tight and when open it would always just kind of be in the way. Well, I think that pretty much covers it. Honestly, I could talk for hours on all the details and parts and components and whatnot, but I think the easiest thing is, if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. 
I'll have the Rhino 3D CAD file for download somewhere, uh, but use that purely as a general reference, as I didn't stick to it 100%. I hope something in that was helpful for someone, and I'll see you next time. Bye.